everyone. It is great to have you back. You are about to hear from Aaron Boxer and Marcus Adele. Now, Marcus's camera is having some problems, so, but Marcus is in this talk and you will be hearing from him soon. Aaron and Marcus have found yet another computing domain whose dominant tooling isn't open source, namely the NVIDIA DeepStream stack. And this is used for AI-powered video analysis. But there are efforts to cast an open source light into this domain though. Aaron and Marcus are going to tell us about Panfrost, an open source driver for the Mali GPUs, and how this can, can be combined with other open source components. Now, they are happy to take questions, so if you can write your questions into the chat channel, and we're, if we've got time, we're going to run through them to use up our time at the end of the talk. Otherwise, they are happy to jump into the, the chat to talk with you about your questions. Marcus and Aaron, take it away. Thank you very much. Um, so hello and welcome to our talk, Transparent Open Source Video Analytics with Panfrost. I'm Aaron. And this is Marcus. Unfortunately, his uh, closed source webcam has decided to not cooperate tonight. But together, we're going to tell you about uh, how we built a purely open source um, video analytics pipeline using Panfrost. And we're also going to talk about how uh, we can gain insight into the predictions that this kind of pipeline can make. So to begin, I'm going to give a very quick overview of um, object detection and the AI field. It's a very vast field and growing rapidly, but we're going to um, stick to uh, some of the areas that relate to video analytics. So here on the slide, we have four different types of object detection tasks, uh, moving from easier to more difficult from left to right. So the first um, task is called classification, where um, we're given a video frame or an image, and we want to uh, determine the most important object in that image. And in this case, it's a cat, and it's, we just have to label that image as a cat. Moving to the next uh, um, task is localization, where we're able to put a bounding box around that cat. And uh, moving to the right again, we have now have cats and dogs, and we're able to identify them. Oh, and there's a duck. And um, put bounding boxes around all those objects. And finally, on the far right, um, we're, it's a segmentation where we can put uh, an outline around each important object in the scene. Um, one, one interesting thing to note about object detection is up until, let's say, 20 years ago, it was generally believed that it would take a very long time, maybe 100 years, for a computer to match a human at object detection just because our visual system is very good at detecting objects and we are it's been evolving for hundreds of millions of years. And yet, as of around five years ago, we now have um, computer systems that can beat the average human at detecting objects. So we've moved very fast in a very short period of time. And let's find out how this came about. Um, the current approach to AI is based on a philosophy called connectionism. Um, and that uses the mammalian nervous system uh, as a model for building an intelligent system. So here in the slide, we have two neurons connected by synapse. And the neuron on the left has inputs from other neurons. And those inputs affect the voltage in that particular neuron. When the voltage reaches a certain level called the activation potential, it will fire its uh, signal down the synapse to its connected neuron. And when that neuron reaches its activation potential, it will fire. So each neuron individually is relatively simple. But when you get billions of neurons connected together, and also when you can change the connections between the neurons based on your environment, when you can learn, then you get an intelligent system. And that's how our brains work. So um, connectionism abstracts this uh, biological system to a uh, computer model called a deep learning network. So the neurons uh, that we saw are now those um, nodes, those round uh, circles. Um, and instead of voltages, we now have numbers flowing through the network. Uh, so on the left, there are input nodes where the, um, the, the data comes in. Then there are hidden nodes uh, that receive those numbers and pass them down the um, network. And then on the, on the right, there are the output nodes that give us our result. And since there are uh, three hidden layers between the input and the output, um, we call it a deep learning network. 
Um, important to note that the arrows between the neurons, um, for each arrow, um, there's an associated weight, which is just a number, and that gets multiply that multiplies the output of the um, the neuron coming in, and um, <clears throat> we can <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we can um, change the value of those weights, and that's how the the model actually responds to the input data. Those those weights get um, modified, and there's also uh, something called an activation function, which affects the output of one neuron coming into the next, and that adds some nonlinearity to the system. Because if it was just a linear output, then we would just have a large linear system of equations, which is uh, doesn't really capture some of the more interesting tasks in the world, which which have nonlinearities. Um, and so, <clears throat> once we have a model set up. We um, want to train the model with data that we've already um, that we already understand. We know what the model should output for the training data. So we feed the training data into the nodes, and we adjust the weights um, based on what the the model outputs for the initial data. So um, we want to um, iterate and adjust the weights, and hopefully those weights are going to converge to some fixed points. And once it does that then the model is considered trained. It's learned the patterns uh, from the training data and is ready for um, new data that we've never seen before. And this is typically done on a discrete GPU uh, because it requires a lot of uh, horsepower. Once the model is trained, uh, we're ready for inference. And that's when we, we receive data that we've never seen before. And um, if the model has been trained well enough, then the outputs for the new data should match the patterns that is learned from the training data. And um, when you do inference, typically it doesn't require as much compute resources. And so this is more suitable for a low power edge device, which is what we focused on. And so um, we'll talk a little bit about running AI on an edge device. So typically an edge device is um, low power, low memory, low compute. and so. Uh, when you're trying to run machine learning on these devices, it's very important to be as efficient as possible. And so we have to do a couple of things to the network that we've designed to make it uh, efficient. And those tasks are called pruning and quantization. So if we go back to our deep learning network, and we see all the uh, arrows connecting the nodes. Um, we can actually remove some of those arrows and prune the network and maintain the accuracy at the same time. So whenever we remove an error, we're reducing our computational load. Uh, and the second thing we can do is called quantization, where we take the weights that are um, that are associated with each arrow, and um, if it's stored as a 32-bit number, we can actually store it, let's say, a 16 or 8-bit, and that reduces our memory requirements. And it also allows us, if we have vector uh, hardware, we can we can actually operate on multiple weights with the same number of CPU cycles, so four 8-bit weights instead of one 32-bit weight. So um, those two activities will help us get our efficiency um, uh, up while maintaining the same level of accuracy. Um, now we can talk about the hardware that's available for this type of, uh, we're working on the edge. Um, it's not, it's kind of limited at the moment. Uh, a popular solution is the NVIDIA Tegra. Uh, that you see over, um, pictured over here. Um, the drawback, of course, is that it's closed source. And um, there's vendor lock-in with CUDA library, um, which is the language that only works, works only with NVIDIA cards. So if you wanted to customize your model with some custom operations, you'd have to write that in CUDA, and then you're stuck with CUDA systems. It's also uh, rather expensive. So uh, at Collabra, we wanted to build uh, an open source stack that would free the developers from this lock-in and um, provide more choice in the marketplace. And so um, this is where Panfrost comes in. And Panfrost is an open source driver for ARM Mali GPUs. And it's fully upstreamed into Mesa, which is the Linux graphics subsystem. Uh, team lead is our very own Alyssa Rosenzweig, who is also at Collabra. So some of the features that Panfrost has uh, made it appealing for this project. Uh, particularly, it's recently supported GLES 3.2. GLES is the embedded version of the OpenGL 
graphics language. And GLES 3.2 uh, supports compute shaders, which are small programs that you can um, schedule from user space and schedule to run on the GPU itself. So um, here's a pathway for running our compute intensive um, neural network on the Mali GPU. And we'll see how that uh, is important in a bit. Uh, in terms of the hardware, we chose the Rock Pi 4, um, which is a very nice system. It's got four core CPU, four core Mali GPU, and four gigabytes of uh, DDR RAM. And um, these systems unfortunately run a little hot. So uh, here's Marcus's cooling system, cooling solution. Um, the, the chip is buried somewhere underneath that huge fan, um, but don't try this at home. Um, the alternative is just to use a large heat sink instead of the fan. Um, so, so Panfrost is in place. We have the hardware. The next uh, level up the stack is a toolkit to manage the neural network, manage the training, and manage uh, storage and of the actual model. So we uh, chose TensorFlow Lite to manage that level for a couple of reasons. TensorFlow Lite is uh, based on Google's TensorFlow library, and it's designed for edge devices like mobile IoT. And they focus on Android and iOS, but uh, we were able to tweak it a little bit, and we could get it to work with Panfrost. Uh, one notable feature for TensorFlow Lite is they have uh, delegates, which are ways of offloading the compute. Uh, typically, TensorFlow Lite will run on the CPU or the DSP of your device. But uh, with the delegate, you can offload compute into the GPU or onto a second DSP. And fortunately for us, there is a GLES 3.2 delegate. And so uh, now we have a pathway from TensorFlow Lite to schedule all that compute on the GPU. And that saves power and gives us better performance. So we have the driver, and we have the neural network uh, layer. Uh, the next layer in the stack is the multimedia framework to actually handle the video. And to do that, we chose to use GStreamer. GStreamer is everyone's favorite open source multimedia framework. It's uh, graph-based, so uh, you can create very complex bespoke um, um, pipelines for video and audio. Uh, it supports a lot of hardware, a lot of hardware and software codecs. Uh, currently, it does has no support for neural nets, so we want to fill this gap. Um, to do that, we had to um, get a grip on the different, the many different neural network toolkits that are available, TensorFlow, PyTorch, MLPack. Uh, we didn't want to have to manage that complexity, but fortunately, there is something called Onyx, which is Open Neural Network Exchange, which sits on top of your favorite uh, neural network library and provides a common format and set of operators. So you can train your system on TensorFlow, for example, and then you can do inference on a different uh, library, and it all uh, works using Onyx. So we decided to write our element based on Onyx rather than a particular toolkit. And so here's our design for our GST neural net class in GStreamer. It's based on the video filter class. Uh, it's, it's a fairly simple. Uh, design that the filter class will just take a video buffer, do something, do some computation, and then either change the actual video frame or attach some metadata to the frame. So um, in our case, our GST neural net will uh, receive a video buffer. It will pass it through Onyx uh, after it um, downsamples the, the buffer, um, and the, our, the AI model will then make its prediction, which gets passed back to our element. And then the neural net will attach a custom meta object for metadata uh, with the label and the overlay, and then passes that to our optional overlay component, which converts that into a composition meta, which in GStreamer, the GStreamer world is a very efficient way of creating an overlay that could then be composited if you want to display the video. So. Um, that's that's our design for the GStreamer level. So now we have the hardware, the driver, the toolkit, TensorFlow Lite, and the video, the multimedia framework uh, using GStreamer. And here's a little demo to show you 
our results. And uh, as you can see, this is pre-COVID, no social distancing, um, just wandering freely about the streets. Uh, but you can see that the uh, accuracy is quite good. This is running on the rock pie. Um, it has some issues with baby carriages, which it thinks it's motorcycles. So um, we might wonder why it's making that prediction. And um, that's actually the second half of the talk, which Marcus will talk about explainability, how we can explain how uh, the system made that prediction. And here's a summary of our results. We used uh, a model called Optimize YOLO. And you can see that um, accuracy is 83%. And it's running quite nicely on the GPU. So we were very, very happy with the, that result that we got. And so um, next, we're going to actually talk about, uh, for example, why that baby carriage, how to get insight into why a baby carriage would look like a motorcycle to a neural net. And that is explainability. And Marcus is going to tell you about that. Take it away, yeah. Marcus. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, that's right. So the second part of the talk is going to be about explainability for machine learning models. And to be clear from the very beginning, we are not going to go into much detail about specific deep learning techniques. Um, I think a lot of academic works in this area touches on these specifics. Um, we are much more concerned about the, the data regarding human behavior. Is, is someone going to pay their bill? Is someone going to default back on their loan? Is, is someone, you know, turn from one phone company to another phone company? Um, does the um, face recognition implementation identify the right group of people? Or is, yeah, is the object detection model picking up the, the right features? Um, those kinds of problems. And yeah, th there's a lot of good things going on when it comes to explainability. But there's also a lot of bad and ugly things going on. Uh, when it comes to explaining a certain type of predictive model. So um, I'm going to start from a very broad, um, non-technical perspective and slowly move into details. And yeah, if, if you have any kind of clarification question as, as we're going along, just put it in the chat and, and we are trying to, to clear it up. Okay, so um, yeah, what, what is machine learning explainability? So assuming you know what uh, machine learning is, you know, machine learning is this um, subdiscipline of AI that, that learns these um, very complex functions from, from data um, that's typically trying to predict or classify or even discriminate between different types of um, phenomena, right? So yeah, the, the, the problem is that these functions become very, very complex and difficult to interpret, difficult to explain to your boss how they work. And when I say difficult, I mean borderline impossible. And yeah, so they, they become difficult to explain to your coworkers how they work, difficult to your customers how they work. So they tend to be very, very accurate predictors, but very difficult to explain. And yeah, there are a lot of the definitions um, what machine learning explainability is. Um, the, the one here shown is one of the, the simples and also one of my, my favorite quotes about um, machine learning explainability. So yeah, we, we, we are looking for, for a way to present or explain to a human being what um, complex mathematical function that's been trained um, from, from data is doing. And if you have not read um, towards the rigorous science of interpreting machine learning, um, I mean, it's, it's not even a long, long paper. I, I highly recommend reading it. It's very approachable even for, say, um, the, the business analyst community uh, would probably be able to get something out of it. And of course, Collabor is not the only one um, thinking about machine learning explainability. In fact, there is a large group of academics that work under the acronym FAT, um, Fairness, Accountability, Transparency, and Machine Learning. And they have a great web page that goes into a lot of details about um, what explainability is exactly, why it's important. So yeah, I, I would urge you to, to check that out. And then um, another group of researchers um, in this field is um, from, from DARPA. So yeah, it's the, the military, military basically. 
And yeah, I, I guess you can imagine why the military is uh, especially interested in machine learning explainability. And um, yeah, they, they call their program Tsai or Explainable AI. And yeah, they have a nice website as well that talks about some of their unclassified um, goals as well. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so yeah, now might the question come up. So uh, why, why should we even care about explainable AI? And yeah, this is one, also one of my favorite quotes. Maybe it's a little bit not to care, but I, I think it's a really, it's really important. Um, it, it's not just about helping banks use uh, more accurate um, predictive models, even though that's basically what the um, commercial drive is about. In general, um, artificial intelligence promises us uh, more convenience, organization, optimization in our day-to-day -day lives. And these techniques uh, or technologies become more and more important in our lives. Um, we will probably have more questions about how they work, especially we will have uh, questions about when they go wrong, um, if they send us to jail or, or don't let our kids into college. So there's a very, very important social aspect to those kind of problems now. And yeah, um, we, we are working for an open source consultancy and, and we are mostly uh, interested in helping others use those uh, very complex predictors. Um, that's our professional goal. Um, but I think it's very, very important to think about the, the way these artificial intelligence systems will be impacting our day-to-day -day lives. And, yeah, we, we certainly want to know how they are making decisions as they become more and more prevalent in our lives. And yeah, I, I think another aspect of um, um, the, those problem that's very important, um, I, I guess we have all seen something that recently, um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, they, they, they happened an accident because something was not classified or even misclassified. Um, next slide, please there are bad jail or parole decisions being made because people type in the, the wrong number into a black box model and it's letting yeah, dangerous people go free. It's keeping innocent people in prison um, who don't deserve to be there. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, we, we, we are doing a lot of bad medical diagnosis and, and screening because for example, the, the algorithms um, are dependent on factors that are not allowed to be there, like like words within an X-ray image. So um, the, the model depends on those rather than the actual image itself. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, another example, we are, we are make, making bad loans and, and credit decisions based on um, faulty informations. Um, so yeah, it, it, once again, it, it will be very important to be uh, so that we are able to debug those systems to understand if um, somehow um, someone um, tampered with it. Um, uh, but it's very, very difficult to do that without um, having deep insight into the internal mechanisms of this system itself. Um, whether the system has been tampered with, whether the inputs of these systems are being tampered with, or the um, output of the uh, systems are being tampered with. So, yeah, I, I think there's both very important social and um, commercial motivations for those kinds of problems. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, so why, why haven't we be doing explainable AI right from, from the start? Um, next slide, please. Well, it, it's simple because it's it's difficult, right? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, three reasons why I feel it's difficult um, that I've run into my undertakings into the direction, but you may run into other problems um, because I, I think it's a fairly fraught and, and difficult problem to solve. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so machine learning algorithms create um, functions that are interestingly combine and recombine variables until they are interest, uh, interacting in a very, very sophisticated ways. So one goal of machine learning explainability is to disagree a prediction to form something that is called a reason codes. So um, one example is you, if you're ever been turned down for, for a credit card, or even looked at your credit report, the, the credit rating agency or the credit lender, they have to give you, I think in the US, it's uh, five reasons 
why they turned you down. And those are called um, reason codes. And yeah, th th those are related to your input variables that went into their credit scoring model. That's basically a black box um, that decided you wouldn't probably uh, pay your bills. So if you ever turned down for, for a credit card, you might see something like um, your length of credit isn't long enough, your, your savings account balance isn't high enough, um, things like this. But it doesn't say the, the sophisticated interactions between um, your, your savings account, um, your, your length of credit history, um, your, your debt to income ratio, and five other variables um, why, why they, they turned you down. So we have to break it down into simple terms, and those are called um, reason codes. And um, yeah, that, that's sort of fundamentally the, the, the odds why the, uh, the, the way machine learning algorithms work. Um, machine learning algorithms interestingly consider high degree interactions between input variables. And so disaggregating a prediction's interest, seeing a feature contribution is a difficult thing to do. And yeah, often even questionable. So yeah, one, one thing to remember is that a lot of these approaches that we will talk about are approximate. Um, some are very approximate. Um, next slide, please. Um, yeah, OK. And, and another reason why I find machine learning algorithms explainability to be difficult is uh, illustrated here. It's a little bit advanced, but um, I will see. We, I, I think we will get it. Um, so when I train a good old fashioned linear model, it's called a convex optimization problem. And what that means is given my input data and some numeric value, some combinations of those parameters and your input data will lead to the lowest possible error state. And you can see in the, the image on the, the left, um, there's only one possible lowest error state and consequently only one best model. It's not quite Good, but it's not far from um, wrong, actually. Now, when, when, when I go into the, the machine learning world, I can actually have many good models for the same data set. And this is a well-known um, phenomenon and, and sometimes referred to uh, as the multiplicity of, of good models. So even for, for a well-good understand, uh, understood data set, there, there, there's many potentially even an infinite number of machine learning models that can give you good predictions. So when I go to, to explain one of those models, it's very crucial to, to remember I'm just explaining one. Um, we, we happen to be using um, the one model out of many, many good models for this, pro uh, this problem. I'm, I'm just explaining one. So the, the essence here is even if I'm able to explain a certain kind of model, I can directly transfer that knowledge to, to the next one. Um, even if I, I built uh, on a model that I, I really under, uh, understood well. Um, that's next slide, please. Um, the, the, the third reason um, why I think machine learning explainability is, is difficult is much more um, fundamental. Um, we, we all have seen that the, the field of machine learning is growing rapidly, um, producing a wide variety of, of learning algorithms for, for different applications. Um, and and the, the ultimate value of those algorithms is to a great extent um, yeah, judged by their success in um, solving real world problems. And therefore, um, algorithm replication and application to, to new trust are, are crucial to the progress of the field. Um, however, few machine learning researchers or, or companies currently publish the, the software um, source code or maybe even more importantly, the, the data associated with the um, paper or software. And actually, yeah, as Aaron already mentioned, we, we can see that for the whole software stack. Um, currently, the, the landscape of machine learning software and hardware is um, throughout dominated by, by NVIDIA and CUDA. Um, yeah, NVIDIA GPUs have become enriched and, and dominant, and, and also it's, it's possible to go out and buy an AMD GPU and use OpenCL-based or ROCKM-based um, linear algebra libraries. It's yeah, and NVIDIA's excellent CUDA linear algebra, uh, algebra support like um, Kublas or QDNN that yeah, have propelled NVIDIA to the, the market leadership. But yeah, we, 
we like to to see that changed in the future by by showing it's possible to build upon a complete open source stack um complete um open source video driver open source software and also open um open data but yeah the 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 lack of openly available algorithm implementation is a major obstacle um to to yeah scientific progress uh, in and beyond our our community but yeah, we, we believe that open source can play a very important role in removing that obstacle. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so those are the, the three reasons why um, we think machine learning explainability is difficult. Of course, um, there, there are other issues um, which make machine learning explainability difficult, but the, yeah, again, those are the, the major issues we identified for, for the talk. So now the question might come up, um, how can we do this? Um, how can we do explainable AI in, in real life? Um, well, I think one of the, the most important ways um, to start is by understanding your data. And there are a lot of ways to understand data, of course. Um, I, I, I mentioned that in the, the um, reason number three, why machine learning explainability is difficult. You can only do that step if the data is um, available or even open source. Um, next slide, please. So one particular way um, is through data visualization. So there's a lot of ways to visually understand data. Um, these are just two of my favorites. Um, I, I, I really much like the 2D projection that you are seeing on the left because here I've projected uh, 28 times 28 dimensional um, data set down onto just two dimensions. So that gives me a, a, a way to actually see and maybe understand things in my data, such as hierarchy, um, sparsity, clusters, um, outliners. And all of those things would be impacting my model and, and things I would expect my model to learn uh, if it did a good job. So basically, we start at the um, very beginning and say, I need to get some understanding of my data so I can check that my model understands my data at least as well as I do. Now, um, the, the graph on the, the right has a lot of different names but I, I just call it the correlation graph, which helps us understand the, the relationships in the data set better. So the, the graph on the um, left is about structure. We hope, uh, we hope a model would learn. The, the graph on the right is about understanding relationships that a model would learn. And I, I, I really like both of those graphs because they put uh, high dimensional information into just two dimensions. So. Um, we can just look at it. And um, an, uh, another thing I like about the, the correlation graph is that I can see high dimensional um, uh, relationships. Um, so for example, I can identify groups of variables that are highly related to, to each other. And yeah, th those are the, the relationships that we would hope a well-trained uh, machine learning model um, would pick up. Um, next slide, please. Um, another technique uh, for, for data visualization is um, saliency or, or saliency maps. And, and saliency maps have been getting a lot of attention lately, especially in the um, computer vision field. Um, they are a popular visualization tool for, for gaining insights into uh, why a deep learning model made an individual decision such as yeah, classifying an image and major papers such as dueling DQN and, and adversarial examples for, for ZNNs um, use um, saliency maps in order to convey uh, where the, the models are focusing their attention on. And, and, and saliency maps are, are usually rendered as a heat map where the, the hotness corresponds to, to regions that have a big impact on the uh, model's final decision. And they are helpful, for example, when you are frustrated by your model incorrectly classifying a certain data po point. Um, yeah, be because you can um, take a look at the, the input features that led to that decision. But um, the, the problem is that saliency, um, if, if, if the image is uh, misclassified, you can tell where the, the network is looking, but it doesn't tell you anything about what the net uh, network is actually doing. And yeah, there's a, a great story I, I like to tell because it's a great illustration of how AI gets the, the wrong idea 
um, what problem we are trying to solve. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and, and the story is that um, researchers at the um, University of Tubing trained a neural network to, to recognize images and then had it to point out which part of the images were the most important for its decision. And, and when they asked it to highlight the most important pixels for the category Tench, which is kind of a fish, um, uh, this is what it highlighted. Um, human fingers against a green background. And uh, yeah, so the question might be, why was it looking for human fingers when it was supposed to be looking for a fish? Well, it, it turns out that most of the detention pictures that were used to train the neural network um, were from, from people holding the fish as a trophy. So, um, yeah, it, the, the network doesn't have any context for what detention actually looks like. It just assumes the, the fingers are part of the fish now. So, yeah, just one example that um, shows um, saliency could be helpful and yeah, it also shows that, uh, yeah, how, how important it is to inspect and clean your data. Um, next slide, please. Mm, an, an, another way um, uh, for for um, inspecting your data is called perturbation, and and the method has been around for for many many years now. And the idea is that um, we, we like to understand the importance of certain features by masking out the the input. For example, here we have a castle, and you would then measure what happens if uh, you would mask out some of uh, some parts of the image. And in the, the first two examples, you can see that the model is able to, to classify the image as a castle. Um, so we could derive that there are not so many important informations for the classification, uh, where in the, the example at the bottom, the model may not be able to classify the image as a, class, a castle anymore. So we could derive, OK, there is some important piece um, in that region for the, the classification. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, another way for, uh, for, for explainable AI um, um, could be practiced by, by simply training explainable models. I'm, I'm not going through all the links on the slide, um, but every link on this page is, is open source software that is capable of training accurate and explainable models. So yeah, no excuses, um, a lot of things to try. And, and in broad classes, um, these are decision trees, uh, monotonic gradient boosting machines, um, also, rule-based rule models are very powerful. And another model uh, is a super sparse and, and, and linear integer models. Um, yeah, very powerful models um, besides um, neural networks. Ne next slide, please. Um, yeah, one, one last method I'd like to mention uh, is, is called layer-wise relevance propagation. Um, that is pretty similar to the idea I mentioned before, but is uh, specifically designed for, for neural networks where the idea is to use structure to simplify the explanation problem. So instead of, instead of explaining the, the whole model at once, um, you, you split up your model into simpler functions, and uh, which are way easier to, to explain, and um, use the, the LRP um, divide and conquer idea to, to com decompose the, the model and explain the simpler functions and ag aggregate that information uh, in a meaningful way later. Um, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, he, here are my uh, recommendations if, if you're doing um, explainable AI in, in real life. So just in general, consider deployment. Um, in, in most cases, your model works really well on your laptop, but um, if you move the, the model from your laptop onto your big secure server or your embedded system, um, strange things happen. Um, I, I've seen a lot of bugs in the internals. Um, the model will get one uh, row wrong to get 10 rows right. So the, the explanation for, for the row that uh, is, uh, the model gets wrong is, is, is incredibly useful. Um, also, um, random data attacks. So we just take our system over the weekend and just expose them constantly to, to random data. And, and, and we will find all kinds of interesting things. So I highly recommend that technique as well. Um, Exactly, um, and, and 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 yeah, we we um, we used all all, all the ideas I, I mentioned um, above, so um, to to better understand our machine learning model, um, which not only enables us to to train a model on our desktop and later to to deploy it onto uh, an embedded device like the the RockPy, 
But um, since we, we used a transparent and explainable model, we could identify and avoid a lot of bugs in the internal implementation, um, so the, the kernels and um, the, the data loading process. Um, that's yeah, and, and that's not uh, that not only increased the, the model performance, but also resulted in a much more explainable model and, and transparent model. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, next slide. Can... Okay. Um, thank you very much, Marcus. And yeah. uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We really enjoyed presenting. We hope you enjoyed our talk. Um, if you want to know a little bit more about uh, what we're doing at Collabra, there's a blog post from Marcus on our site. There's also the Twitter. And uh, if, you have, if you have a few minutes and you'd like to ask questions, please join us for the Q&A afterwards. Thank you again, and have a great conference. Bye. Thank you. That was great. We do have uh, a few minutes for questions, and we do have uh, at least one question from the audience, and I've got a few uh, more more dummy questions. <laughs> so let's jump into the first one from the audience. It comes from Will Brown, not the Will Brown who we had as a presenter just before, but uh, Will Brown from the core team. Will's question is, in the late 90s, there was an take in fractal image recognition based largely on Irving Biderman's work. Has fractal image recognition been surpassed or is it still being used in part? Interesting. That, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's still used in, in, in some areas, but yeah, nowadays um, it's, it's all about um, deep neural networks, right? So um, yeah, th they dominate the, the whole pipeline from from data loading uh, up to to um, yeah the actual model design. Cool. Um, you were talking about explainability, and when I was listening to your talk, I was abstractly wondering who is the target audience for these kind of explanations, and what kind of technical knowledge are you anticipating that they will have? For example, can you explain this? to me as if I'm a five-year-old? Or are you explaining it to a business so they can, you know, leverage or improve? Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I, I think everyone should at least think, uh, think about explainability because, yeah, it, it's super important. Um, and if, if you have some um, general understanding of uh, uh, linear algebra, um, you, you should be ready to go. Um, but yeah, I think everyone should should at least look at least once into explainable AI. Cool. Um, another question that I've got: um, you showed us some two-dimensional projections, and they looked fantastic. In fact, it blew my mind that you could go from twenty-eight dimensions down to two dimensions. But I wonder, are there like three-dimensional graphs on projections that are useful or practical? Because we're seeing you know, um, virtual reality kind of goggles and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, there's one more th method called um, Teense that is um, used um, all the time. Um, that's for, for three dimensions. Um, but yeah, uh, in, in most cases, I'm, I'm just starting with two dimensions because it's easier to, to um, visualize and go over to, to three dimensions, yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, one of your slides was a bunch of open source projects that I think you said had explainable models. Is it possible to provide that slide and its links to the chat after this talk? Of course. Great, fantastic. Well. We've only got uh, one more minute to go. Um, I don't think we've got any questions that have been passed through to me. So we might start wrapping it up there. Thank you so much. That was a great talk. I really appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you for um, as, as I understand it, at least one of you are coming from Canada, which is a really different time zone than what we have in Australia. So we've, we very much appreciate that you've come all that way. Um, <laughs> For, for those of us in Australia, it's now time to have a cuppa, otherwise known as afternoon tea. Um, we are going to be back. Oh, pause one moment. We've got 20 seconds for a quick last question from Jan Schmidt. Have you looked at NN Streamer? Any thoughts? 10 seconds. Um, 
Yes, we did look at an streamer, um, which is further along in the actual implementation. But um, we had some issues just with the, the quality of the code. Uh, and we wanted to actually design something that would um, have input from the upstream for the actual design process. And then streamer is already quite far along in that regard. So that's why we decided to uh, design our own rather than reuse that framework. Great. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there. We will be back um, at 3.45 p.m. in Australia, Melbourne time zone, which is in about 30 minutes. And when we get back, we've got another AI talk. Charles Martin is going to explain how, how, about his efforts to use machine learning to create new musical instruments. See you all then. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.